Basic English for Computing by Eric Glendinning and John McEwen. Published and copyright by Oxford University Press. Side 1. Unit 1. Everyday Uses of Computers. Task 4. Extract 1. We use a PC for writing letters, for playing games, to calculate our bills and to connect with the internet. Extract 2. We've got electronic checkout tools with barcode readers. They read a special barcode on almost everything we sell. They calculate the bill for the customer. At the same time, they send information to a larger computer, so we always know exactly what we've got in the store. Extract 3. We make washing machines and refrigerators. The machines we use to make them are controlled by computers. We also use computers to calculate our wages, uh, to keep the accounts and to look after all materials and parts. Extract 4. Our terminal links to airline offices. If you want to fly anywhere in the world, we can tell you at once if there's a seat on the flight you want. We can supply you with the tickets and we can reserve your hotel, all by computer. Unit 2. Types of computer. Task 3. Buying a computer. 1. Part 1. I'm thinking of buying a computer and I need some advice. OK. What do you want to use it for? For writing. Maybe for games. I want it for the internet. For the internet and games? Mm. I recommend a multimedia computer. What do you mean by a multimedia computer? Well, it's more powerful than a basic computer. It's got sound and a CD-ROM drive. You can use it for high-quality graphics, animation and video. Part 2 What if I wanted... I travel a lot. If I wanted something smaller, what's available? There are portable computers. A multimedia notebook is probably best. Is a notebook the smallest kind you can get? No, you can get sub-notebooks and even smaller handheld devices. They're mostly used as organisers, as a diary, a to-do list and that kind of thing. But for writing and general use, a notebook is better. Hmm, OK. I think I'll go for a notebook. What other things do I need? A printer. And, and for the internet, make sure you have a modem. A modem? Yes, it's a device for connecting your computer to a telephone line. Ah. You need it to connect to the internet. Unit 3. Parts of a computer. Task 3. What about things like power and speed, that sort of thing? What do I look for? Well, power depends on speed and capacity. The speed of the processor and the capacity of the memory and the hard disk. The speed of the processor? Mm, how fast the computer processes data. Oh. Speed is usually given in megahertz. The faster the processor, the more powerful the computer. Mm. And capacity? How much storage space there is in the computer. Capacity depends on how much memory there is, how big the hard disk is. Mm. You measure RAM and video memory in megabytes. You've also got cache memory. That's in kilobytes. Always look for the highest numbers. What about the hard disk? Hard disk capacity is in gigabytes. <laughs> hmm, get a big hard disk for multimedia. Uh. Audio and video files use enormous amounts of space. Once again, the higher the numbers, the more powerful the computer. Hmm. Unit 4. Keyboard and mouse. Task 4. The keys on a computer keyboard could be arranged in many different ways. The most common way on a desktop PC is called the extended keyboard. The diagram shows an extended keyboard. The keys are in four main sections. The section known as the main keyboard has a key for each letter of the alphabet. It also has keys for the digits 0 to 9, punctuation marks like commas and full stops, and other common symbols. Above the main keyboard is a row of keys known as the function keys. This section includes the escape key to the left and the print screen, scroll lock and break keys to the right. 
the function keys labelled F1 to F12 don't have fixed functions. You can program them to perform different functions, such as saving and printing. To the right of the main keyboard is a section known as the editing keys. This group includes keys which insert and delete data. It also includes the cursor keys, also called the arrow keys. These keys move the cursor around the screen. To the far right of the main keyboard is the numeric keypad. This section has keys for the digits 0 to 9 and for common mathematical symbols like plus and minus. The keys are arranged like the keys on an electronic calculator. You use these keys to input numerical data. Unit 5. Interview. Student. Task 2. Part 1. Course. Tell me first of all about the course. What's the course called? Information Technology 3. How many students are there? In my class? Yes. Well, at the beginning, 17. Right. But now there are 15. How many are men and how many women? Three girls and 12 boys. How long does the course last? A year. And it starts in August? September. And it goes on till June. Tasks 5 and 6. Part 2. Timetable. Tell me about the timetable for your course. Well, on Monday I've got Communications 4. It lasts for two hours, 9 to 11. Then it's Numeracy 3. Numeracy? That's some kind of maths? Yes, but it's more logic, uh, problem solving. And do you have a break between classes? Yes, a half hour break between 11 and 11.30. Do you have other classes in the afternoon? Not on a Monday. What do you have on a Tuesday? Programming. Is that... well, tell me what it's about. We study computer languages like Pascal. So, Tuesday, after the coffee break, what do you have? I'm sure it's hardware. No, it's software. Computer software. What happens in the software class? You learn to use MS-DOS and packages like databases. Do you have a class on a Tuesday afternoon? No, and nothing on a Wednesday. Nothing at all? No classes, but sometimes we visit companies. Tomorrow it's the Royal Bank to see how they use computers. Uh, what do you have on Thursday? Thursday? I'm not too sure. Um, hardware is last thing, half past two. What happens in hardware? You find out about all the different things inside a computer. What about Friday? We've got networks first thing. We learn how computers work connected together. Anything on a Friday afternoon? That's IT in business and industry. It's applications. That's what our visit tomorrow is about. We have to write a report on each visit, five or six pages long. Task 7. Part 3. Student Life. You have a very busy time on this course, but is there time for anything else? Is there a social side students can enjoy? There's football. And there was a students' night in Betty's Bar for all the new students to get to know each other. Is there a students' union? Yeah, on the main campus. They organise discos, but I live out of town, so I don't stay on at night. And I've got a job two nights a week. Oh, what do you do? I work in a hotel. I'm a waitress. So, you work in a hotel part-time? Yes, just to make some extra money. <laughs> Do you want to work in catering after you graduate? <laughs> no, it's the worst hours for the worst pay. Unit 6. Input devices. Task 4. Computers can listen to your voice and change what you say into a written message or into orders. Voice input is a great help to people who cannot use their hands. It also helps people like pilots, who need their hands or eyes for other tasks. There are five steps in voice input. Step one. When you speak, you produce audio waves. A microphone changes these waves into electrical waves. That's step two. Inside the computer, there's a speech recognition board. In step three, the speech recognition board processes the waves from the microphone 
to form a binary code for each word you say. A binary code is a pattern of zeros and ones. For example, 01001100. Each word has its own code. In step four, the computer compares the code with other codes in its memory to identify each word. When it finds the correct word, it displays it on the monitor screen. That's step five, the last step. Unit seven, output devices. Task three. There are three different types of printers. These are dot matrix, inkjet, and laser printers. Basically, you get what you pay for. The more you pay, the better the printer. Dot matrix printers are the cheapest kind of printer, but their print quality is low, and they are slow and noisy. They're cheap to run. Pay a bit more for an inkjet, and you get better quality and quieter operation. But inkjets are relatively slow and also expensive to run. They're a good choice for color. A laser printer gives you the best quality of output. It prints faster than either of the other two types of printer, and it costs less to run than an inkjet. Great for black and white. Unfortunately, it costs almost twice as much. Unit eight: Storage devices. Task three. Part one. The hard disk drive inside your PC. Is like a filing cabinet. Instead of paper, it stores everything electronically. It can hold all the software that runs on your system and all your personal files. It's a pretty important part of your computer. A hard disk drive normally contains several disks. They're stacked on top of each other. There are five in the diagram. The drive motor spins the disks very quickly. It runs all the time your PC is in use. There's a gap, a space between each disk. We need the gaps so the read-write heads can move across the disks and reach all parts quickly. The head motor controls the read-write heads. Task five, part two. The space between the head and the disk surface is tiny. Even smoke from a cigarette can cause a crash. A crash. Is what happens when the head touches the surface of the disc. To keep out dust and smoke, the drive is inside a sealed case. Unit nine, graphical user interface, task four. This is a picture of a computer screen with one window open. The window contains a dialog box. This one is the Find dialog box. You can see the name on the title bar at the top of the screen. You use this dialog box to find files or folders. Near the top of the window, there are three tabs. The first tab is for searching by name and location. There are two other tabs: one for searching by date, and the other for advanced searches. To search for a file by name and location, you type the name of the file. In the drop-down list box called "Named," in this example, the user wants to find all the document files. Then you choose the folder to search in using another drop-down list box labeled "Lookin." Here, the user wants to look in the folder called "Personal" on the C drive. So the first drop-down list box is for the name, and the second drop-down list box is for the location. Between the named and look-in drop-down boxes is a text box. In the text box, you type any words which you want to look for. In this example, the user only wants documents with the word "sport." You start the search by clicking on the "Find Now" command button. Other buttons stop the search, start a new search, or browse the drives. Unit ten. Interview, computing support assistant, task two, part one, introduction. What do you like most about your job? I like 
I like all aspects of the job. It's good to... It's varied, so there's lots of interest. <laughs> Are you ever bored? Mm, no, n- not really, because it's never the same things over and over again. It's different each time. <laughs> problems. What kind of problems are there? What kind of difficulties do people have? People have problems with the hardware, often with printers, uh, paper jamming. (laughs) They also have problems finding options in the programmes, uh, mostly with word processing. Are there any other hardware problems? Occasionally a computer freezes. Um, it, It hangs or freezes. It's usually a memory problem. Is it always the machine or is it sometimes the user? Sometimes it's the user. The printer isn't switched on, or there's no paper. Task 3. Part 2. Keeping up to date. How do you keep in touch with what's new in computing? (laughs) It's changing all the time. (laughs) Yeah, by the time you read something, it's out of date. Magazines are good for finding out what's new on the scene. The internet also has information about new developments. Do you ever go on courses? Oh, yes. They're a good way to keep up. What kind of courses? Well, operating systems change. So, courses about the different functions on the operating system. And then there's the programs that people use, like the word processors and the spreadsheets and the databases. Mm -hmm. And the best way to understand them is by taking a course and trying them out yourself. Unit 11. Networks. Task 7. Computers in a network can be connected in different ways, in different topologies. The three basic ways of connecting computers are a star, a ring, and a bus topology. A star topology has a server computer at the centre and a separate cable connecting the server to each of the other computers in the network. The central server controls the flow of data in the network. If the central server fails, the whole network will fail. In a ring topology, each computer is connected to its neighbour in a circle. The data flows in one direction round the ring. If a cable breaks or one of the computers fails, the whole network will be affected. A bus topology has all the computers connected to a common cable. The data travels in both directions along the cable. If a computer fails, or we remove one from the network, it won't affect the other computers. Most networks are usually a combination of star, ring and bus topologies to overcome some of these problems. Unit 12. Communications. Task 4. Thank you for calling Tatron. The office is now closed, but if you'd like to leave a message after the tone, dial 1 for sales, dial 2 for maintenance, and dial 3 for all other inquiries. This is John Bales with a message for Lenny Yang. Uh, I'm sorry to phone so late, but I can't make our meeting at 10.15 tomorrow. Uh, There are no seats on the 8.30 flight. I've got a ticket for the 9.45 flight, which lands at 10.30. Uh, If the traffic isn't too bad, I can be with you around 11.15, say 11.30 to be safe. So, can we meet at half past 11 tomorrow? If there's any problem, please email me tomorrow before 8.30. Uh, My address is bales, B-A-I-L-E-S, at brant.co.be. See you tomorrow. Unit 13. The Internet. 1. Email and news groups. Task 3. Hi. I started my course last Monday. We've got classes every day from 8.45 until a quarter past four, apart from Fridays when we finish at 2.30. We can use the computer lab then, so I've taken the chance to send this message. The course is okay so far. Design and make is the best class. We've got to construct a project of our own. I'm thinking of a security alarm for my bike. Staff are fine, apart from maths. 
no sense of humour, and I'm getting to know the rest of the class. There's an indoor sports centre we can use at lunch times, and a few of us have started kicking a ball about most days. We might get a team going. Let me know how your course is going and how life is treating you. If you're free on the 17th, come over. I'm having a party at my flat. Nothing fancy, but you'll meet Sandra again. Unit 14. The Internet. 2. The World Wide Web. Task 3. 1. This button stops your browser downloading information. Maybe because it's taking too long, or you're bored, or you've made a mistake in the address. 2. Whenever you find a page on the web that you like and want to visit again, you can save it with this button. 3. This button will get you a fresh copy of any document you're looking at. 4. Click your mouse on this button and your browser will reload the last page you were at. 5. This button will take you back to the browser starting page. Unit 15. Interview. Website designer. Task 2. Part 1. What kind of people want websites, and why do they want websites? People who feel they have to be on the web because competitors are on the web. They feel that not having a website is a sign of being behind the times. So, other people have got a website, and therefore they have to have one too? Yes. The better reason is people who have information they would normally provide free, like brochures, application forms, anything that would normally be sent out by mail. So it saves fax, postage... Printing costs. I think it's particularly useful for colleges and universities. Why is that? Because they tend to have a large amount of information to distribute. If a client comes to you and asks you for a web page, how do you set about designing a page for a client? The first thing I would ask for is all their printed promotional material. Mm -hmm. I would look at all that material and then discuss with the client how much of it to put on the web. The most important thing is to decide who is the audience for this website, who's it aimed at. Is there a danger of putting too much on? There's certainly a danger of putting too much on. Um, also, the client has to make a clear decision about how much time or money they're going to spend to keep the pages updated. Aha. Uh -huh. So it's not enough simply to have a page. You need regular maintenance of that page. Right. So these are the first two questions. Who is it aimed at and how often will it be updated? Task 3. Part 2. Once we've decided what materials should be put on, there are a couple of basic principles to follow. One is that there should never be any dead ends. You should never reach a page which has no... Oh, um, which doesn't go anywhere. Which has no links uh -huh. to take you back to somewhere else. So that's one principle. And the other principle is to try to limit the number of steps that have to be taken from the main home page to any other page. Uh, I would normally aim for a maximum of four steps. Do people give up if there are more than two or three links? They simply give up. Is that a problem? Some people will give up. Others will just never find the information. <laughs> there are too many diversions. Mm. Another principle is not to have too many links to scroll through on one page. Uh, if you have a page which has 150 links and you have to keep scrolling through them, people will give up. They'll never find the links at the bottom. What about graphics, sound and animations and all these multimedia features? What's your feeling about these? Always ask, why is it there? That's the first thing. And if it's there simply because it makes the page look nicer, think quite carefully about whether to put it there or not. The more of that sort of thing you have, the more time it will take to download the pages. Another factor to bear in mind is that there are still a lot of users with less sophisticated browsers than Netscape or Microsoft Explorer, and if you make the use of the page dependent on graphics and so on, you'll exclude these users. So, no dead ends, mm. no more than four steps from home, and pictures have to serve a serious purpose. Task 4. Part 3. Another aspect of designing pages is to break the information into relatively small sections. 
Is that just because of the size of the screen? What you can see at one time? It's partly that, but it's also to do with download time and printing. People can find they're printing 40 pages of a document, most of which they don't want. Is it a big temptation to add links to similar organisations? Is there strength in that, or is there a danger in that? In most cases, it's a big strength. Browsers who come across your page, if, if they discover that your page is a very good gateway to all sorts of interesting sites, will bookmark your page because they know it's a good way to get to all the other sites. Mm -hmm. If they're coming back to it, they're exposed to your message every time. One final point. It is useful to have on the front page something brief which catches the reader, which says, this is who we are. Unit 16. Word processing. Task 3. The diagram shows a Microsoft Word 97 screen display. The title bar at the top of the screen shows the program you're using and the name of the file, in this case, printer. Below the title bar is the menu bar. The nine items on this bar each give access to a pull-down menu. File, edit, view and so on. The standard toolbar is next. It contains buttons for the most commonly used commands, such as open documents, print and spell check. Each button contains an icon. The formatting toolbar is below the standard toolbar. You use it to alter the font, that's the typeface, and the style of letters, bold, italic or underlined, and generally to alter the appearance of your document. The bar at the bottom of the screen shows more information about the document you're working on. For example, it shows which page you're on. It's called the status bar. In this example, the user is on page 1. Unit 17. Databases and Spreadsheets. Task 8. 1. Cell D2. Equals B2 plus C2. 2. Cell A7. Saturday. 3. Cell B5. 1004. 4. Cell C7. 614. 5. Cell B9. Equals sum B2 to B8. 6. Cell E2 equals D2 times 17.5%. Unit 18. Graphics and Multimedia. Task 3. Extract 1. Right. It's a very simple graphic. It's a square for the wall, a triangle for the roof, two small squares for windows, and a rectangle for the door. Right, we'll start with a box shape, a square. Point with the cursor at the image you want in the toolbox. That's the rectangle. Click with your left mouse button. Now move the pointer to the screen. So the cursor turns into that sort of gun sight thing? Yeah. Press and hold down Shift. Mm -hmm. Now drag the pointer to make the square the size you want. Keep your finger on the left button, then let go. Extract 2. Now you want another square for a window. Just the same way, point with your cursor, click with the left button and hold shift down. Extract 3. Say you want the next square to be exactly the same as that one, right? Click on the select box and then drag your cursor over the first window. Make sure it's all included. Now go into the edit menu, click on copy, then on paste. See how the second window appears? Now click on it and drag it into the house. You can get rid of the dotted lines by clicking outside them. Extract 4. Now you want a door. 
So you go back to the rectangle, click with your left mouse button, drag the rectangle to the size you want, and release the button. You don't need shift? No, that's for squares, not rectangles. Extract 5 We want a triangle next. Click on Polygon. That gives you any angled shape. Start at one corner of the house and draw one side of the roof. Mm -hmm. Then click on the opposite corner and the lines join up by themselves. Extract 6 Hmm, it's a bit steep. OK, we can rub it out easily. Click on Eraser. You see, your cursor becomes a little square. Mm -hmm. You can erase the first roof and make a lower one. 